The following presentation is brought to you by Discovery Channel School, a leading provider of quality educational resources that help teachers bring the world to their students. On this episode of Assignment Discovery, follow scientists from crime scene to conviction in Discover Magazine, Forensic Detectives. See how dog hairs, tire tracks, and carpet fibers lead to the criminal. Then, join the science detectives and find out if this painting is truly a lost Leonardo or a forgery. And for lesson plans on the science of forensics, go online to discoveryschool.com. Consider this before viewing Discover Magazine, Forensic Detectives. Technology plays a key role in solving crimes. As you watch the program, note how older, established methods are used alongside new ones. How do these technologies support each other? If you could use only one technology to help solve a crime, consider what you would choose. Assignment Discovery now presents Discover Magazine, Forensic Detectives. A serial killer is taunting the police by leaving the strangled bodies of his victims in plain view. Detectives and forensic specialists come up with only the tiniest of clues. A few hairs and fibers. And a muddy tire print. Can these lead to the killer? In the summer of 1994, the first victim, LaDonna Jean Steller, is discovered in a vacant lot in Clearwater, Florida. Investigators find no useful evidence at the scene. A few months later, a delivery driver spots something in the weeds on the side of the road. He calls the police. First on the scene is Officer Glenn Ward. He checks for a pulse. Sector 89, confirm signals. There is none. 94, please. Next to arrive is the Pinellas County Forensic Science Unit. Their job is to locate and collect physical evidence. These aren't your tire tracks, right, Glenn? No, sir, no. Lieutenant okay. Walt Jakes notices a possible clue, a tire print at the edge of the road. The sandy soil in this part of Florida doesn't usually make for a clear tire print, but rains during the night have left the ground muddy. First, the track is photographed. Then castings are made of selected segments of the track. Dental cement, the same material used by orthodontists, is poured into a metal form. The Just team searches the grass for trace evidence. For anything that would for us. Using a high-powered light called a luma light, the investigators trace a path to the body. The light reveals substances like fibers, hair, and blood. The luma light shines at wavelengths that cause certain materials to fluoresce. Orange goggles help make evidence stand out sharply. Soon the victim is identified. Her name is Wendy Evans. She was killed by strangulation. 
is a serial killer on the loose in Pinellas County. Evidence collected at the crime scene is sent here to Florida's Department of Law Enforcement. Jerry Serino is the chemist assigned to the case. It can literally take weeks to go through the debris that is recovered from a crime scene. Kind of like looking for a needle in a haystack. Serino looks for things out of the ordinary, unusual colors or materials. And he finds something, a pink nylon fiber, most likely from a carpet. Carpet fibers are valuable clues because they can link suspects to a specific location. Examiners also find hairs on the body, but they aren't human hairs. These short brown hairs belong to a dog. There is one piece of evidence left to examine, the tire track. Peter McDonald is a tire track identification expert. Hello. He agrees to help with the case. McDonald begins by studying the photographs taken at the crime scene. When he examines the tread pattern, he recognizes it immediately. This tire, called an ATX, was designed for small pickups and sport utilities. McDonald tells detectives that the tire print at the crime scene was probably left by a small truck riding on a relatively new set of Firestone ATXs. In the following months, two more murders take place. First, the decomposed body of Peggy Darnell is discovered beneath power lines. Then, Cynthia Pugh is found dead behind a dumpster. Examiners find pink fibers and dog hairs on Cynthia Pugh's body, just like the ones on Wendy Evans. Now there is little doubt. A serial killer is murdering streetwalkers in Pinellas County. The only hope of stopping him is to find the driver that left that tire print. But how? The search starts at the county's main tire dealer, the Don Olson chain. Lieutenant Good pays a visit to manager Larry Morgan. We're investigating a series of homicides over in Pinellas County. And Morgan offers to check the company here, database. The computer shows the tire is sold out. Look at that. We had four, we sold four, September 11th, 1995. The last set was purchased eight months earlier by someone named Terry Howard. Terry Jo Howard is placed under surveillance while detectives check her background. From there, we went out and actually found the vehicle parked at her residence one night and were able to confirm that those tires were on that vehicle. Is Howard the killer? The next step for the investigators is to examine her tires to see if they can be matched to the print. Detective Good comes up with a plan. For you to call Terry Jo Howard and explain to her that the tires that are on her truck are defective, and that way we Since can he doesn't have enough evidence for a search tires, warrant, he needs Howard to give up her tires voluntarily. Detective, I'd be happy to do that. Those Morgan tells tires, Howard that her tires have been recalled and she can come in for free replacements. But we've made arrangements. A week later, Howard shows up for her new tires, accompanied by a man. Hi, I'm Terry Joe Howard. You called me about my tires. The switch takes less than five minutes. At a police garage, detectives prepare to make an ink print of the tread patterns on Howard's tires, now mounted on a similar vehicle. A long strip of cardboard is used as an ink pad. The ink is the same kind used for fingerprints. Looks good. Come slow. Carefully, the tire is rolled over the ink pad. Keep it coming. Okay, go. Are we, are we okay, Sandy? Yeah. Go. The tire is then rolled over a clean length of cardboard. Once all four tires are printed, the strips will be analyzed. But by now, detectives have a new lead to follow. 
Target squawking eastbound towards your car. During the course of the surveillances, we noticed a white male, and that's when we identified James Randall. James Randall, Terry Jo Howard's live-in boyfriend, is the man who accompanied her to the tire store. While detectives check Randall's background, McDonald examines the tires from Howard's car. Treads are made up of geometric shapes called pitches. At first glance, the pitches seem to be all the same size, but in fact, their sizes vary widely. This is the key to tire identification. With the sequence of pitches, you can determine the exact location on the tire that made the imprint. McDonald can now tell which part of the tire left the print. But he still doesn't know if it was this tire or another of the same model. He needs to find a match point, a place on the print that could have been made only by this tire. So McDonald turns to a more subtle feature, the tiny cuts on the tire's surface. These cuts are called sipes. During manufacturing, the sipes are molded into the tires by small steel teeth. But occasionally, tires come out of the mold with a few sipes missing. Why? Because the metal teeth are fragile and sometimes break off. McDonald finds a missing sipe in the tire print. He finds the same missing sipe in the same location on the right rear tire taken from Howard's truck. Now there is no doubt. The print at the crime scene was left by this tire. It's a major break in the case. Terry Joe Howard's truck has been placed at the scene of one of the murders and fibers and hairs link that crime to one of the other murders. And there's more. By now, the background check on James Randall has come in. Randall's past isn't pretty. He served six years in a Massachusetts prison for sexual assault. He was also a suspect in a murder case, but investigators lacked enough evidence to indict him. In both crimes, the victims were strangled. Detectives now want to arrest Randall, but they know that unless they have enough evidence, they can't hold him. They need an airtight case, and they know how to get it. The investigative team comes up with another sting operation. Detectives Linda Hilliard and Stephanie Campbell pose as women here. starting a dog bathing service. I looked and we walked they by. come at a time when they know Howard will be home. She sees them coming up the Hi. walk. My name is Stephanie and this is Linda and we're starting our own dog grooming business. Okay, let's see. Their offer of a free here, introductory here, so flea bath is too good, good for Howard yeah. to refuse. Miss Penny. Yes, Miss Princess Penny. Let's Let me see how she likes set. me. Does she like me all right? She's very Hi, friendly. Hi, friendly. how are you? What a good girl. Can I call me? At an opportune there? moment, Hilliard nice? pockets some hair. Yeah. After the bath, Terry Joe invites the women into the living room. The detectives notice the color of the carpet. It's pink, similar to the fibers found on the murder victims. As Hilliard chats with Terry Joe, Campbell yanks out a few fibers. Back in the lab, the carpet fibers and dog hairs taken from Howard's home are compared with those found on the murder victims. They match. That means the women had either been inside the house or had come into physical contact with Randall or Howard. Detectives now have the evidence they need. They decide to move in on James Randall. But as they approach him, he flees suddenly, escaping into the nearby woods. A massive four-day manhunt can't flush him out. Finally, an exhausted and dirty James Randall 
shows up back at Howard's front door, where he is taken into custody by waiting sheriff's deputies. Terry Joe Howard knew nothing of Randall's crimes. The evidence pointed squarely to him. Randall is tried and convicted of first-degree murder. He is currently awaiting execution on Florida's death row. Forensic science has become one of the justice system's most powerful tools. But even the best tools, if misused, can do great harm. Your Honor, the Commonwealth calls Angela Nichols to the stand. A woman has been brutally raped. At trial, she points out her attacker. That is the man. The defendant's name is Edward Honecker. His trial takes two days. We find the defendant guilty on all charges. Honecker is given the maximum sentence, life in prison. He wonders if he'll ever wake up from what he prays is a nightmare. I remember when I was sentenced, it, it was like, you know, I didn't do this. My last words to the judge were, you've convicted an innocent man. Your Honor, the Commonwealth calls Elmer Gist. The most damning testimony came from a state forensic examiner. Elmer Gist testified that hairs found on the victim closely matched Honecker's. It is unlikely that the hair would match anyone other than the defendant. He is without a doubt guilty. At the and trial's conclusion, the jury took two hours to reach their verdict. Guilty. Honecker was sent to Nottaway Correctional Center in Burkeville, Virginia, to spend the rest of his life behind bars. Most people don't realize what it's like to be inside of a prison. Prison is hell on earth. Honecker spent much of his time writing short stories, a novel, and letters, hundreds of letters. He tried to find someone on the outside who would listen, someone who would believe that a grave injustice had been done. Centurion Ministries. Then Ed heard about the Centurion Ministries, a nonprofit organization in Princeton, New Jersey, that tries to help people who have been wrongly imprisoned. His letter was read by staffer Kate Germond. Germond began by requesting the transcripts from Honecker's trial. When she read them, she understood how Honecker got convicted. Even through the dry transcripts, you could read the strength of the victim's testimony. This was the man. That is the man. So I understood it, but I also clearly saw, to my read, that he couldn't have committed the crime. In the transcripts, Germond saw testimony she found troubling. And what were those test results? We removed two hairs from the crime scene, which were... The forensic scientist evidence. testified that the hairs found on the victim were most likely Honecker's. It is unlikely that the hair matched anyone other than the defendant. But could they be sure the hairs were Honecker's? Hairs simply aren't distinct enough to be linked to an individual. The most we can ever say is that these hairs could have come, in quotes, from the same source. We can never say that, these, that this hair did, in fact, come from a, a given individual. Dr. Peter DeForest is one of the world's leading authorities on the forensic analysis of hair. He was called in to re-examine the hair from the crime scene and compare it to Honecker's. There are a number of features we look at. DeForest first looks at the hair's color. Color in hair is determined by tiny pigment granules that appear here as brown speckles. Adjusting focus lets DeForest examine each plane of the hair shaft for pigment distribution. In some hairs, the granules are distributed evenly. In other hairs, they form clumps. Another characteristic of hair is its outer sheath, called the cuticle. The cuticle grows in overlapping scales, like the skin of a fish. 
These scales can be pointed, rounded, or square, and can lie very flat or curl up. Some hairs have a clearly visible inner shaft, called a medulla. In other hairs, the medulla appears cracked and broken, while others have no medulla. De Forest looked for similarities between the hairs found on the victim and the hairs taken from Ed Honecker. He saw some similarities in color distribution, but he couldn't make a trait-for-trait -trait match between the crime scene hairs and any of Honecker's hairs. Based on his observations, DeForest concluded that the hair found on the victim probably did not belong to Honecker. But Germain discovered yet another, even more startling flaw in Virginia's case against Edward Honecker. During the post-rape exam, doctors had taken vaginal swabs from the victim. Those swabs revealed the presence of sperm, presumably the rapist's. But it couldn't have been Honecker's. He had been vasectomized seven years before the crime. The prosecution attempted to explain this by asserting that the victim had had consensual sex with her boyfriend several days prior to the rape. But sperm rarely survives in the vagina after 24 hours, so it couldn't be the boyfriend's either. But this crucial point got lost in the heat of the trial. Kate Germond refused to give up on Ed Honecker. In 1987, she told him that a recent scientific breakthrough could be his final salvation, DNA analysis. DNA analysis is revolutionizing the criminal justice system, but it is still not widely understood. Each cell in the body contains DNA, shaped like a twisted ladder of chemical rungs. The sequence of these rungs is unique for each individual. Scientists can now remove DNA from body tissues and fluids and make key segments of it visible on X-ray film. The patterns produced in these films can positively link a suspect to DNA from a crime scene but they can also exclude a suspect. German told Honecker that the test could exonerate him, but if his DNA did match the crime scene sperm, no one would ever again believe his claim of innocence. Honecker submitted a blood sample. Germond also persuaded the reluctant now ex-boyfriend to submit one as well. A few days later, the results came back. The boyfriend was excluded. The sperm wasn't his. Honecker was also excluded. There could no longer be any question. Edward Honecker was innocent. That was it. All emotions that I had held in check for 10 years overwhelmed me. After 10 years in prison, Honecker was pardoned and released. He returned to Roanoke, where he lives today. Eventually, he received a settlement from the state of Virginia for his wrongful incarceration. DNA testing is giving a new chance to those who are unfairly trapped by a sometimes imperfect system of justice. Keep watching discussion topics and activity and resources for Discover Magazine, Forensic Detectives are up next on Assignment Discovery. Now that you've seen Discover Magazine, Forensic Detectives, talk about this.
Forensic science has become one of the justice system's greatest tools. Discuss how this field is used in the courtroom. What are some of the risks of relying solely on this type of scientific detective work? What should jurors know about the collection, preservation, and presentation of evidence? Now try this. Using an ink pad, place a thumbprint on two index cards. Label the back with your initials. Combine the cards into a glass deck. Analyze the prints and try to match them with their owners. Log on to discoveryschool.com for curriculum materials and resources to support Discover Magazine, Forensic Detectives. To learn more, Assignment Discovery suggests Crime Science by Vivian Bowers. Consider this before viewing Discover Magazine, Science Detectives. Detecting art forgeries is a part of forensic science. As you watch the program, note how art historians and scientists participate in this process. Pay attention to the procedures each employs. How do the two help determine the value of a painting and the identity of the painter? Assignment Discovery now presents Discover Magazine, Science Detectives. Almost everyone on Earth recognizes this image. The Mona Lisa, one of history's greatest paintings. Created by Leonardo da Vinci almost 500 years ago. Few names in history are as revered as Leonardo da Vinci. Scientist, inventor, and painter, da Vinci's masterful technique and his attention to anatomical accuracy are among his signature traits. But aside from The Last Supper and the Mona Lisa, only a handful of Leonardo's paintings survive to this day. Some experts believe there are fewer than a dozen in all the world. But what if another da Vinci survived? Is it conceivable that a work by the great master, lost centuries ago, could be rediscovered today? And if someone claimed to find such a painting, how could anyone be sure it was authentic? John Harrington, on the right, is an art collector who lives in Florida. He believes that this painting of Jesus Christ is in fact a long-lost Leonardo. And for the past 10 years, he's been struggling to convince a skeptical world. Harrington has had a respected forensic scientist and a handful of scholars study the painting. If they agree it's authentic, the painting would instantly become one of the most valuable in existence. But has John Harrington really discovered a lost Leonardo? How could a priceless masterwork have found its way to, of all places, Florida? In 1984, Harrington took a short drive from his Sarasota home to visit Mrs. Ida Martin. Now, let's see. The painting's up here somewhere. There Harrington had heard that Mrs. Martin was selling a painting that had been in her family for centuries. Careful. Careful. He immediately recognized the painting's subject. Good. Let me get some light on it so I can really look at it. A young Jesus Christ was pictured standing in front of a group of rabbis. 
This biblical scene, rendered by many artists throughout the centuries, is called Christ Among the Doctors. Harrington was intrigued. Some historians had written that Leonardo had indeed painted a young Jesus Christ around the year 1504, but the work had been presumed lost. Could this be that painting? After a quick negotiation, the price was set. Harrington paid Mrs. Martin $3,500, and he threw in his diamond ring. Thank you. But now he faced the big question. How likely was it that he had really just purchased a long-lost da Vinci? It would be much more unlikely than discovering new stars or galaxies. Constance Lowenthal is an art historian and the director of the Institute for Art Research in New York. Even if the evidence did point to Leonardo, she points out, the art experts would fight over it for years. If we were to find a new one today, it might take a long time to get the Leonardo da Vinci scholars to agree, if they ever did. So Harrington decided to bypass the contentious art world. He decided an impartial scientist should have the first look. He called Walter McCrone, one of the world's most respected forensic scientists. Harrington took the painting to McCrone's Research Institute in Chicago. Throughout his career, McCrone has analyzed hundreds of paintings. Using techniques that he's pioneered, McCrone tries to determine the painting's age. Knowing when a work was created may offer clues to who painted it. McCrone's first step is to take samples of the paint itself. For this delicate procedure, McCrone uses a stereo optical microscope, the same tool surgeons use to perform operations. The microscope enables McCrone to see down to the level of the pigment particles. He pries them up with a tiny needle. Then carefully places them on a microscope slide. To identify the particles in Harrington's painting, McCrone examines them under the polarizing light microscope. Since each color is made with a different mineral or vegetable base, each has a unique appearance under the microscope. Most of the time we can look at the particle and say, well, that's emerald green. It looks like slices of a green banana. And anybody would recognize a green banana, so we recognize emerald green. Many colors come from minerals. Rock, red rocks, green rocks, and blue. The iron earth pigments, uh, red ochre, yellow ochre, come out of the ground. In the old days, pigments were ground by hand, so paints were lumpy and grainy. Today, paint making is highly mechanized. Pigments are ground for days between granite rollers to produce uniform particle size and distribution. So an old painting is like an archeological find, a time capsule embedded in canvas. The microscope reveals the state of the art of paint making at the point in history the work was produced. Each pigment, uh, we know when it was first used. Prussian blue, for example, is 1704. If I find uh, Prussian blue in a painting, I know that at least that paint layer had to have been painted after 1704. McCrone spent months examining the pigments in Christ Among the Doctors. He found no modern colors. In fact, he found that the pigments used in the painting were all in use in Leonardo's time, five centuries ago. And Macron found something else. Years earlier, he had analyzed da Vinci's masterpiece, The Last Supper. Macron now had samples of every pigment used in that painting. These were carefully saved on microscope slides. He found that the pigments used in The Last Supper were virtually identical to the ones he had found in Christ Among the Doctors, 
almost as if they had come from the same palette. Macron not only looked at pigments, he also looked at the paint's other ingredients. Besides pigment, which provides color, paint also contains a medium which suspends the pigment and allows the artist to work with it on canvas. The most common medium is linseed oil, and virtually all the painters of the Renaissance used it. But Leonardo, always an innovator, also used walnut oil in his paints. Using infrared absorption analysis, Macron's lab attempted to identify the oil used in Christ among the doctors. The samples were too old to be conclusive, but the test indicated the presence of walnut oil. And Macron also removed a small section of the canvas for carbon dating. This test would reveal the age of the canvas itself. The test produced a date of 1495, plus or minus 30 years. In 1495, Leonardo was 43 years old. I could conclude from, from what I did and from the carbon dating that the painting was almost undoubtedly done during Leonardo's lifetime. When he completed his work, Macron published his findings in a scientific journal. He stated that none of his tests, of the pigments, of the medium, or of the canvas, could rule out the possibility that the painting was a da Vinci. When you get results from the laboratory that say that you have pigments and canvas of the time of Leonardo da Vinci, it's very exciting because you're getting much closer than you thought you could. But you can't quite get to Leonardo's easel with those results because Leonardo and his school in Milan could all have access to the same kind of canvas, brushes, pigments, and mediums. They could all use the same thing. It turned out that science could go only so far in determining the painting's origins. So Harrington was forced to return to the subjective world of art historians and authenticators. Harrington called in James Proctor, an art authenticator who had evaluated other alleged da Vinci's for private clients around the world. Proctor warned Harrington that he was skeptical, but he agreed to take a look. Proctor studied the painting closely. He saw something that, in his mind, left no doubt, the hole in Christ's wrist. Da Vinci was the only one that ever put the nail hole in the proper area. Leonardo had studied human anatomy extensively. Unlike other artists of his day, who showed Christ impaled through his palms, Leonardo knew that the hands couldn't support the weight of the body but the wrists could. In my opinion and my expertise, this is by the hand of Leonardo da Vinci. Scholars will continue to debate the origins of Christ among the doctors long into the future. Perhaps one day, the truth about Christ among the doctors will be known. But as the scientist knows all too well, Truth can be hard to separate from the world of human passion and prejudice. There is a feeling on the part of many actual scholars uh, who feel that uh, it shouldn't be found in a garage sale, for example, or it shouldn't be found by someone who, doesn't, who, who isn't a, an authority on the subject, a member of the club, so to speak. Uh, there is that sort of feeling, uh, unfortunately. John Harrington sees the debate in much simpler terms, snobbery. If my name was John Harrington, the Duke of Attenborough, we would have no problems. As science advances, old questions can be re-examined in new ways. 
And sometimes the answers can change history. In 1971, world-renowned microparticle analyst Walter McCrone was given a delicate assignment. He was asked to determine the age of a controversial map. It was thought to be the oldest map of North America ever found. McCrone had no idea that his findings would lead to an academic uproar. The map primarily showed Europe and Asia, but in the upper left-hand corner was a small island labeled Vinland. Norse chroniclers gave this name to the land that Leif Erikson reached around 1000 AD. Scholars believe it was somewhere along the northeast coast of North America. The Vinland map first surfaced in 1958 when it appeared in the hands of a private collector. It was then sold to Yale University for one million dollars. Yale published a book about the Vinland map. The book said the map was probably drawn in the year 1440 from the records of Norse explorers. It was the earliest known drawing of any part of the New World. But the map raised troubling questions. It showed Greenland as an island, a fact thought to be unknown in the 15th century. Its legends were written in a form of Latin the Norse didn't know, and no other maps like it had ever been found. Some experts believe the Vinland map was a forgery. To settle the matter, Yale asked McCrone to date the map through microscopic chemical analysis. McCrone took microscopic particles from over 30 points on the map. He saw that the ink contained some unexpected material. We did see with these particles uh, that they were of two types. One was opaque, and this would be characteristic of uh, carbon black, which you'd expect in a black ink. We also saw some transparent particles. And these little particles, since I've seen them before and recognize them like old friends, uh, turned out to be uh, titanium white. Among painters, titanium white is well known. In his report to Yale, McCrone detailed his findings. He believed that whoever drew the map drew two lines, a yellowish brown line containing the titanium white and a black line directly over it. The forger drew two lines to simulate the look of ink fading with age. McCrone concluded that the map was an elaborate, skillful forgery produced in the 20th century. Yale was forced to make an embarrassing announcement. Scholarly work on the map was abruptly halted. The university moved quickly to put the episode behind it. But some challenged McCrone's conclusions. Tom Cahill is an unlikely document expert. He's a nuclear physicist at the University of California in Davis. The school owns a giant particle accelerator, or cyclotron. A cyclotron creates a high-speed beam of protons. First, hydrogen gas is pumped into an electromagnetic field created by huge magnets. The magnets push and pull the particles into an accelerating circular motion. At the same time, a powerful electric charge inside the cyclotron energizes the particles to 500,000 volts. When the particles reach the desired velocity, they are diverted out of the field and into a steel tube. Inside the test area, Cahill and his team planned their work. They had to analyze 100 locations on the map. That's right here. Cahill's technique for analyzing the map works like this. The proton beam passes through the map. When the protons hit the paper and ink, 
they disrupt atoms by pushing electrons out of their normal orbits. Then the electrons move back to their original positions. As they do, they give off energy in the form of X-rays. It's these X-rays that Cahill is interested in. We expected to find an enormous titanium X-ray. Instead, we found traces of many elements, copper, iron, zinc, the usual garbage you get from ancient documents. We saw titanium, but in tiny amounts. Cahill didn't prove the map was real, but he now believed it had been dismissed too quickly. For Cahill, the map's authenticity was once again an open question. How could two reputable scientists study the same document and come up with contradictory conclusions? It may have had something to do with their methods. Our analysis was made of the ink on the parchment as they existed. No particles were removed from the map. The Macron analysis required a selection. And from that selection, we start to suspect that there was some bias introduced. Macron removed specific samples from the ink line to study them. Cahill believes this selective approach slanted Macron's results. In essence, he found the particles he was looking for. Macron dismisses this critique of his work. I don't think that's a fair criticism because we took so many samples. We took representative samples from all parts of the map, and they all were in good agreement with each other. Macron believes that Cahill's method was flawed. The proton beam could only analyze ink and paper simultaneously. According to Macron, the paper distorted the results, since the titanium was only present in the ink. It's sort of like uh, looking at a, at a dinner plate and seeing a speck on it. Uh, that speck is 100%. But uh, if you analyze the plate and find the speck is just a trace that is hardly measurable, and that's the case with his instrument. Scholars continue to debate the Vinland map. In 1996, Yale University organized an international conference to mark the republication of their book. No map has ever been subject to greater controversy or greater study. The conference made clear that the tide of opinion had shifted away from Macron's forgery theory and toward Cahill. Nobody has the answer. And I do not want anybody, especially a scientist, to simply make one measurement and say, this map is dead. I think it's an uphill fight. I'm outnumbered about 20 to 1. <laughs> For Yale, the conference was a victory. It reestablished the possibility that the Vinland map was indeed a genuine artifact from the 15th century. The riddle of the Vinland map may never be totally solved, but there is no doubt that scientists and scholars will continue to fight about it. I see no reason why I should change my mind or slant it in any direction. I, I, my mind is, was made up when I first saw the yellow ink line itself. That leaves me with an inescapable and very positive conclusion. The Vinland map is a fake. We've never seen a forgery that has been looked at so closely by so many techniques, by so many scientists and historians, and not fallen apart immediately. If it is a forgery, it's the most spectacular forgery in history. watching discussion topics and activity and resources for Discover Magazine Science Detectives are up next on Assignment Discovery. Now that you've seen Discover Magazine, Science Detectives, talk about this. The authenticity of the Vinland map continues to cause disagreement among scientists. Why is disagreement or debate essential to the scientific process? Compare the evidence for the two opposing views in the debate over the Vinland map. 
which is more convincing? Now, try this. Suppose letters thought to be written by Abraham Lincoln were recently discovered. List the steps forensic scientists would take to analyze them. Who else could assist in proving their authenticity? Log on to discoveryschool.com for curriculum materials and resources to support Discover Magazine, Science Detectives. To learn more, Assignment Discovery suggests Artful Dodgers by Walter C. McCrone.